Provincial Response Update for Friday, October 23rd. Joining us today is Ch Provincial Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Saqib Shahab. Also on the phone line, Saskatchewan Health Authority CEO, Mr. Scott Livingstone. Today we'll have a brief statement by Dr. Shahab before proceeding to questions. Uh, just a reminder that in accordance with spokesperson guidance during the election writ period, the Chief Medical Health Officer and the Saskatchewan Health Authority will provide only technical or factual information and will not participate in debate of programs, policy rationale, or defensive programs as promoted during the course of the election. Thank you, and Dr. Shahab. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, just a recap of this week. Since uh, Monday, we have had 260 new cases, bringing our provincial total to 2591. Um, and we have 511 active cases now in the province and 92 recoveries this week. And certainly it's been a week where our case numbers have continued to show a slightly upward trend, which we need to monitor very closely. Um, our hospitalizations also are slowly trending upwards with 20 cases now in hospital, including four in ICU. And if you look at our average case rates over a week period, we have gone up from 2.8 new cases a day on average per 100,000 to 4.2 new cases a day per 100,000 uh, this week. Uh, and that translates to a seven-day average for new cases from 34 new cases a week uh, uh, the week before to 46 new cases this current week. And as I said before, because our case numbers fluctuate, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, we, uh, um, I, I like to look at the average over the, the past week uh, because that really uh, evens out the day-to-day -day fluctuations. Our provincial sources of transmission also tend to differ based on where you live, urban versus rural. In urban areas, of course, we have seen large transmission events linked to uh, uh, you know, uh, nightclubs and fitness facilities. In rural settings, the clusters tend to be uh, due to private social gatherings, weddings, um, uh, you know, gatherings in the home, uh, house parties, uh, and also in some cases, uh, as we've seen uh, from the PA exposure and from the Saskatoon uh, exposures, bars and nightclubs, that they also can be people uh, visiting urban areas, obviously, uh, for, at different venues, and then uh, t taking uh, COVID back to many rural communities as well. And in all cases, this increase in local community transmission is then also spilling out into workplace settings. And this really uh, is a reminder for all of us to, uh, you know, make sure that we are practicing uh, best practices at all time. As we look at the last nine months, um, you know, while uh, our case numbers have gone up and down, we know that this is not going to go away and we need to uh, live with, you know, preventing COVID cases surging, tolerating a higher case number than we have had in the past, but also doing the best we can to make sure that you know our workplaces, schools, businesses, recreational facilities, as much as we can remain open. Um, and for that, you know, we need to obviously practice, you know, um, um, uh, staying home if you're unwell, hand washing, maintaining physical distance, mask use where required. The other thing is that we need to um, obviously uh, l make sure that what is happening in our local area and then sometimes that's uh, a reminder for us to take precautions, especially if cases are surging in parts of the province where we are and we on our dashboard, you can look at the active case number by geography. But because we have community transmission now throughout the pro uh, province, the basic principles remain the same. Really, just because your own part of Saskatchewan doesn't have a high active case, it doesn't mean that we should uh, lag on some of those preventive measures that are so important. So finally, I'd just uh, like to say that, um, you know, we have seen, for example, in the Yorkton area that they had, you know, a significant uh, outbreak that then uh, led to cases in many settings, but they've turned the corner. So over, you know, two to four weeks, you know, uh, 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 
people who are symptomatic, isolating, getting tested, having a list of close contacts ready to give to public health, public health following up very quickly with close contacts who are isolated so that in case close contacts became symptomatic and a significant proportion do, they were already isolated. So that really breaks the chain of transmission. So while uh, Yorkton had uh, quite a high active case rate uh, two to four weeks ago, they've now they are seeing a declining active case rate. So they're getting over their initial, you know, several outbreaks that they had. And this is, again, uh, what we hope will happen now in PA, Saskatoon, um, uh, Regina, which have seen an increase in uh, case numbers. But, you know, with people staying home when they're sick, see seeking testing if they're symptomatic, having a list uh, if they test positive COVID, having a list to quickly hand over to public health and public health contacts them, and then cases and contacts complying with public health direction to stay home for the 14-day period. I think these are going to be essential measures beyond the overall general measures we should all follow to make sure that our case numbers remain low. On another positive note, so far less than 5% of new cases cannot identify a source of transmission. So while our rising case numbers are concerning, we, uh, uh, we still can, in the vast majority of cases, identify links to a known transmission event, whether it's a bar, a gym, or a, a gathering that happened. So th that is very important that we can identify uh, sources of transmission and cases and contacts quickly. But that's another uh, number that we will be monitoring, that what is the percentage of cases uh, that cannot identify a source of exposure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahab. We'll now take about 30 minutes of questions. Um, all of our callers are, well, all the people who have called in our questions today. Moderator, can we take the first call, please? Yes, we have Guy Quinnell from CBC. Hi, thanks for your time today. Uh, Dr. Shahab, you mentioned some of the bigger picture stats. You know, we've seen double digit case increases for, for two weeks now. Our active cases, as you pointed out, are the highest they've ever been. You haven't announced any major new measures since after the Thanksgiving uh, long weekend when you reduced the private indoor gathering cap to 15. And at each of these news conferences, you've reiterated time and time again that people have to follow the existing rules. But given the community spread that you've noted today, that doesn't seem to be working, just telling people to follow the existing rules. So what new measures will you, as our chief medical health officer, undertake to stop this concerning spread of COVID-19 throughout our province? Yeah. So a couple of things. One is, of course, we have been following the trend not just in Saskatchewan and local communities in Saskatchewan, but in other parts of Canada, and also uh, monitoring what measures have been taken and what their impact is. So at this point, obviously, our case numbers uh, 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 on, a, on a daily basis are trending upwards, and our case numbers per 100,000 are trending upwards as well. Uh, but we are obviously also looking at the settings for transmission. And like you said, we reduced indoor gatherings um, in, in homes to 15. Uh, we think that will have a moderating effect. Uh, we did see a bit of an increase that was linked to th Thanksgiving. Not too much, but we did see a definite signal. And that's a reminder for all of us, while Thanksgiving was a weekend where people would have been more likely to get together, as we move forwards, we really have to be cautious about any event and, you know, where you can have a smaller event rather than larger event, whether it's a birthday or a wedding, and defer that major celebration to maybe uh, a few months into the future. I think that's really important. Um, you know, I, I, I have had situations where I wanted to go to a funeral of, you know, dear friends that, you know, I have lost, that, you know, many of us have lost, but I stayed away and grieved virtually uh, to enable close family members to grieve safely. And I think we have a knee-jerk reaction to really run, rush towards celebrations or uh, when there's a, uh, a, a death, but I think we all need to model moderate uh, this, and we need to space things out, slow things down. And secondly, where, whereas there's been some sectors that have been impacted, you know, two um, outbreaks linked to gyms, uh, two outbreaks linked to bars and nightclubs, I think we also need to avoid a knee-jerk reaction against entire sectors. Uh, obviously, where there's um, a non-compliance with guidelines that results in some follow-up warning letters or tickets, but even when they all guidelines being, being followed, I think public health inspectors and medical health officers are reviewing the guidelines working with business owners, everyone wants to prevent large outbreaks, but at the same time, we can't 
prevent small transmission events. We already know this as we reopened. So we're, we're learning uh, from you know events that happen about what further can we improve and, and update guidelines from those learnings. For example, um, in gyms, you know, initially when uh, gyms started, everything was spaced out. There were very few people who were um, uh, using gyms, but then uh, you know um, more and more people have been using gyms. So gym owners are already reviewing. You know, do they need to relook at spacing things out and are there places, you know, at entrance ways or check-ins where people may be congregating and just space those things out. And then people who visit gyms or other public facilities, the, you know, everywhere initially we saw that people were maintaining the two meter distance, wearing a mask. And in some cases, you know, that there's a bit of a crowding sometimes at a public venue. And I think we all need to also work with business owners that to maintain that physical separation. Um, similarly, with bars and restaurants, I think many bars and restaurants are look, looking at their business operations, making sure that they are not exceeding their capacity limits, and maybe even reducing the capacity limits, really looking at how you can space people out, how, how to make sure that people with the group sit at their assigned seating and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, be served, whether it's food or drink. I think that at this point is what we need to do. Um, I think we are certainly not at a point where we can look at slowdowns or lockdowns. But you know, if these case numbers keep continuing, uh, we, especially in specific parts of the province, we may have to look at that. But I think we have to balance. We certainly don't want to go to a situation where we were in March, April. We know more about COVID now, about how it behaves, and we need to use that knowledge to stay keep our businesses open, keep our venues where we socialize open, but I think slow things down, uh, spread things out. And my final comment I'll make with, with, with schools is that again, you know, I'll just speak to schools where we've had now, as we expected and as other provinces have seen, we've had 62 cases in 50 schools, um, but you know, 20 schools have come out, uh, 22 still have a case that is active, and seven schools have more than one case. But again, through following those layers of protection, you know, mask use, staggered start, stop times, staying home if you're unwell, you know, schools have demonstrated that you can have these events where you have numbers of pe people in an indoor setting, but following all those cohorts, and you can you can you can't prevent every case from presenting in a school setting, but you can try to prevent larger outbreaks, and and work. Workplace is another example that, for the most part, many workplaces have had very good guidelines, but some workplaces have really stopped practicing those guidelines that they did practice as an essential workplace in March, April, or maybe as they opened up in June, July. A public-facing workplace had guidelines that they had to follow, but a, a, an office area, which a private or public, which wasn't really open to the public, maybe didn't really think through that. And now that uh, workplaces have had cases or clusters, they're also now having to rethink their operating procedures. That okay, how do you maintain that physical distancing at work? How do you make sure that? Employees at work are not part of your bubble, and if there are areas where you know you can't maintain that physical distance, corridors, washrooms, elevators, stairwells, you know, mask use uh, is an important layer in the, in those settings as well. Thank you. Follow up, Guy. Yeah, I'm just hoping you can answer more succinctly. Although I do appreciate all that detail. My next uh, question, which is, you know, you've said that 60 or more cases could trigger new measures or more restrictions and we've had you know two days this week uh one day 66 and uh just yesterday 60 new cases uh that meet that threshold so given that why won't you put in place any new measures to help curb the spread of COVID in this province? So our average case per 100,000 right now is 4.2. That's gone up from 2.8 uh, per 100,000 two weeks ago. And we have already actually put in the uh, in, um, gathering limit for households down to 15. But again, I think what we saw in March, April was that you don't always have to be at the maximum all the time. I think all of us need to run below the, uh, the, even the 15 limit. And I think that's what's worked for, uh, well for us. But certainly, if there continues to be increased case numbers, we will have to look at further specific measures, uh, which may be sector specific, if that's a problematic area in certain sectors. But again, I think at this point, our case numbers are such that uh, you know we really need to bring this down as a collective effort. Um, 
And we all know that if we went into total lockdown, case numbers uh, would go down. We all know that from March, April. But you know, there's a tremendous cost to that in terms of mental health, economic impact, livelihoods, all kinds of, and that's where we don't want to go. And also, you know, uh, we can see that many other jurisdictions really don't want to go there. Obviously, if it comes to that, that is always an option, but that should not be the first option. Thank you. Uh, mo moderator, next caller, please. We have Zach Becerra from the Star Phoenix. Good afternoon, Dr. Shahab, and thank you as always for your time. Um, today it was reported that there have been uh, 37 cases so far linked to a single nightclub venue in Saskatoon. I'm aware of two nightclubs where outbreaks have been declared. Can you say which venue has, has, been, has had these cases linked to it? Well, my understanding is most of the recent cases are linked to the second uh, event, you know, the um, um, uh, uh, second bar. Uh, but, they, but, they, but we have to remember that cases do accumulate from, um, uh, so I can't separate the two, the number out exactly to the first venue and the second venue because you can see secondary and tertiary cases for a long period of time. And from the PA event, already we are seeing now third generation, fourth generation transmission. Uh, but you know, at this point, uh, most of the cases are from the second venue. Follow up, Zach? Yes, thank you. I I'm aware that many of these bars and restaurants often share a pool of staff. They may also have common patrons, people who go to more than one bar in a given night. Are we al aware of any incidents where cases at bars and restaurants in places like Saskatoon are interconnected? Is there, is there a concern there? We are not aware, but I think we in Canada and most parts of North America and, um, and uh, Western Europe are hampered because we don't have mandatory uh, tracking gaps. In Southeast Asian countries, they have seen that a single person who can go bar hopping can expose dozens of people. And unfortunately, uh, we um, are not able to use that. Um, that in my view, everyone should have the COVID app. It's available, downloaded, and active. And that will enable us to answer exactly what you have said. Uh, but at this point, obviously, if a person has gone to more than one venue, uh, then we do give a public service announcement that you know lists all the venues. But because that those are public spaces for bars or restaurants, sometimes we can contact all the patrons who visited on a specific day and time uh, and notify them. But in other areas like retail locations, that is not possible beyond a public service announcement. And that, again, is the value that all of us, in my view, should have the COVID app downloaded. Um, if you are um, if you uh, are test positive as a, as a case, uh, then you can enter a code. It's all anonymous. And then that will let everyone else who was in your vicinity over the 14-day period, or now they've made further enhancements to the app, where if you know if you have a date or time when you start showing symptoms, then the two days prior to your date of symptoms, and then everyone else in your vicinity will be notified whether you were in a bar or restaurant. So we have a powerful tool, but we aren't using it enough in Saskatchewan or elsewhere in Canada. Thank you, moderator. Next caller, please. We have we have Britton Gray from CJME. Well, Dr. Shahab, I'm just uh, wondering, there were two events in Saskatchewan, curling events that have been postponed uh, due to government advice saying that they weren't following the, uh, the guidelines in place. I've been speaking to curlers, and they br bring up a good question as to why would these curling events get cancelled, but other leagues are allowed to have more than 50 people, and fans in some cases, and just the reason behind that. Yeah, uh, I, I just got some early information this morning, and I think there's a couple of aspects of that. One is that, um, you know, play itself is not risk-free but can be safe, and curling, for example, which is a sport that many uh, people in Saskatchewan enjoy, while nothing is risk-free, it can be, you know, you can ha play in a safe, safer manner, and that's certainly something uh, to be encouraged, and where you have competition. We do want to promote the concept of mini leagues where you have a limited number of people, maybe up to 50, playing locally with a limited number of teams, not go, become, making it into a bigger tournament where people are traveling from all over. I think we really need to uh, not go there right now because then you can import cases and export them out, which we did see in March and April. Um, the second thing is that a lot of the transmission events in March, April uh, that we saw didn't happen actually 
uh, while playing, it happens in th those very important, th uh, you know, uh, socialization that happens before and after play or, or during play when, you know, you're sitting and, and, and meeting other team members. And that's where we need to be extremely careful. You know, it's, it doesn't come natural, naturally to us to sit on the bench with a mask on two meters uh, away from your teammates and, uh, you know, not mingling with uh, other players from other teams. And if, you know, you are having a meal, you know, sitting, um, you know, in, within your cohort of six people, if it's a restaurant, uh, but uh, and and practicing all those precautions because that's where the transmission happens. And same for spectators, you know, where spectator limits are uh, are allowed to a certain level, we have to maintain that physical distancing. I think that is going to be so important to allow us to enjoy sports activities, going to a bar, or restaurant, and not having mass transmission events. We will always see small transmission events or clusters. But we really need to all work together to not ha have those super spreader events. Thank you, Dr. Britton, a follow-up? Yeah, I guess uh, my question is, why are there these sort of inconsistencies when it comes to these different rules for different sports? While curling might have had their event canceled because they were over 50 people, but hockey leagues are going to get up to maybe over 100 people in these mini leagues and such, according to some guidelines, yeah. if that's so, the case. So, so what? What's going on yeah. with these inconsistencies in regards to these different things? Yeah, I, I think most uh, leagues uh, are being asked to stick to the mini league formula. Some hockey leagues that are more professional uh, have been given a staged approach, but nothing is set in stone. If case numbers rise, that will be revised, both for players and spectators. Uh, because again, the risk is transmission to uh, between teams and, and, and to households where, uh, where players reside, and then further into communities all over Saskatchewan. So nothing is set in stone, and all these um, uh, future plans for uh, play, playing uh, in certain sports, like uh, at a professional level for hockey, you know, bigger teams, uh, all of that uh, may have to be revised if our case numbers continue to rise. Thank you. Dr. Um, moderator, next caller, please. We have Remy Othier from Radio Canada. Hi, Dr. Shahab. I was wondering uh, if you are aware of the existence of a Facebook group called the No Mask Saskatchewan. Um, we've seen in Quebec, at the very least, some anti-mask group grow. And uh, so it seems the authorities are concerned Quebec as we see cases grow where they are particularly active, these groups. Uh, are you aware of this, the existence of this group? And are you worried about it? Are you trying to reach out to these people to try to change their, their habits? So I'm sorry, I, I did not uh, get the name of the group. No Masks. No Masks yeah. Saskatchewan. You know, I have not uh, heard of this group, but I know that, you know, uh, uh, many uh, responsible so social media platforms are actually trying to not promote uh, non-evidence-based uh, um, uh, uh, theories because there is information overload for the public, and all of us need to be very cautious about, uh, you know, getting um, pulled into, um, you know, um, uh, uh, information that really is not evidence-based. Um, and, but and it is challenging, you know. I think we all feel um, um, challenged by the fact that we all have to do everything very differently, uh, you know, nine months into the pandemic. But I think it is so important that we go to credit credible websites, we look at our own experience through those simple measures, you know, staying home if you're sick, maintaining a two meter distance, wearing a mask, washing your hands before and after going out. We have been able to keep our case numbers low. And you know, all of us, when you go out, look at the ro how busy our roads are, look at how busy our uh, you know, parking lots are in commercial areas, outside offices. We are doing more and more things uh, outside, you know, whether it's shopping, getting ready for the holiday season, whether it's going out, eating at a restaurant, you know, uh, going to a bar, going to work, children going to school, playing a sport we like. But we all have to do this in a way that we can't prevent the occasional case and cluster, but we have to all contribute to preventing an upward case number. And, you know, mask use is one and an important layer, I would say an essential layer, there are hardly any situations where you can't wear a mask for the few minutes that you're in a retail location or going into an office for some work. And if all of us does this consistently, I think mask use itself consistent can bring down our case numbers by at least half. 
Uh, but then all the other layers are so important, maintaining that physical distance, staying home if you're sick. We'll never go down to zero to five uh, if we have the level of activity we're all enjoying. But we really need to keep our case numbers as low as possible and as flat of a line as possible. Thank you, Dr. Remy. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. All right. I believe we have one more caller, moderator. Hmm, where is he? Moderator, do we have another caller on the line? Yes, we have Nathaniel Dub with Global News. Is it my turn? Yes, Nathaniel, you can hear us. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't hear the, the prompt. Uh, Dr. Shahab, I'm wondering uh, what plans the SHA has uh, in terms of hospital capacity. I'm wondering if there are, are new plans to, to increase capacity, considering that the COVID cases in the province are increasing. Yeah, I'll give some initial remarks, but Mr. Livingston is on, so I'll yes. then defer to Mr. Livingston as well. So, you know, we, this is all interlinked and there's a cascade. The best thing we can do is prevent COVID transmission, all the things we have to do all the time. And then, you know, getting tested when symptomatic, as soon as the results come back, you know, being able to give our contact list to public health, quick uh, contact tracing. But then, of course, we have seen, unfortunately, that as our case numbers have gone up, uh, you know, our hospitalizations are going up, you know, 20 hospitalizations, including four in ICU. So, yes, that is absolutely a concern, especially if we enter in, uh, as we enter into the winter. That's also a really important reason why should, we should get uh, the flu shot to minimize avoidable hospitalization as much as we can. But for uh, further comments, I'll uh, maybe defer to Mr. Livingston. Thanks, Dr. Shahab. So just going back to the strategies that the SHA put in place at the beginning of the pandemic, and, and we released our pandemic plan, both the offensive and defensive strategies, which were primarily focusing on bed capacity uh, on the defensive side in April, those, those have not changed. And I would say, you know, as we see uh, the cases creep up, you know, we are, like Dr. Shahab said, concerned about the number of hospitalizations as they grow. You know, over the summer, the cases we saw, many were not hospitalized. We were really fighting the battle in the community, but it's really dependent upon who's getting sick that uh, will, will push us for capacity. We, as as you know, uh, unlike in April, uh, where we were uh, busy planning and building capacity, we had reduced services. So we are in the full veg, uh, uh service resumption. So we are providing services to non-COVID patients and COVID at the same time. So we, so we continue to build capacity. And, and the other thing that's important is we, you know, as we see Saskatoon and Regina uh, as our main hubs, but we do have acute care bed capacity across this province. And one of the things that we were, were working on now is making sure that we use all our available capacity. We've trained staff across the province to manage COVID patients or patients that are a risk, uh, high risk. So uh, we will use that capacity before we see any other major changes. But we're watching the numbers just like Dr. Shahab has said, and as we see those trends go up, we will uh, put other uh, initiatives in place to support patients as we need to. Thank you. Uh, Nathaniel, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I'm wondering if you can tell me uh, what the, I guess, threshold is for when you would uh, start limiting services, and if that threshold has changed uh, from now, uh, or between now and uh, March, Mr. Mr. Livingston, do you hear that? Sorry, Dr. Schaub, did you want to start or do you want to... No, I think if you could speak to that, thanks. Okay, sure. Thanks. So, so again, there, there's so many different factors that go into how we, we trigger building extra capacity. And again, as I started in the, in the last question, it's, it's, it's who we're seeing. So we don't automatically roll up capacity because we're seeing infections. You know, we, we do see the hospitalizations about three weeks after the infection starts. Um, and, and it's who's getting sick, like I said, that's important. In the summer where we saw our peaks on July 28th, very few people were hospitalized, and if they were hospitalized, they weren't ventilated and they were in hospital for a short period of time. But if we do see uh, in this, uh, you know, as the cases, if the cases continue to go up and we see, you know, fragile elderly with chronic conditions or young folks with lots of chronic conditions, those are our high-risk groups. We know that. Uh, so we will, we will, you know, build capacity if we need it. Right now, we're, we're not in that space. So like I said, there is capacity across the province that we could utilize, and we will do so. And uh, the triggers, but the triggers haven't changed. And, and, and again, it's because we don't really know 
what we're, what's going to come next week other than, you know, because of what we're seeing this week, we're going to see some uptick in hospitalizations down the road here because we've seen over 260 cases this week, and we've got to be prepared for that. Thank you, uh, Scott. I believe we've had another caller join us. Moderator? We have Callie Stefano from CTV. Hi, Dr. Shahab. Um, so when it comes to Regina's rising case counts, do we know what those are from? You know, of course, the Saskatoon, the nightclub um, in the North Central region, um, the gospel worship events. But, you know, any idea why we're seeing rising case numbers here in Regina? Yeah, so, you know, um, you know, I am in daily contact with uh, medical health officers um, uh, throughout the province. And you're right, Regina is seeing a slightly different trend from Yorkton and Saskatoon and PA. No, as far as I'm aware, no single mass gathering event, but just a consistent increase in transmission signifying, you know, higher risk of community transmission. And the exposures are, you know, due to international travel, interprovincial travel, and then secondary exposures in household and work settings. Um, so it's all of these small transmission events that all add up. Now, on a positive note, I think Regina Public Health has been wor working very actively, and they have very few cases where they can't identify the source of exposure, whether it's international travel or uh, interprovincial travel. So that's the good news. But obviously, for all the reasons uh, we discussed above, because we are out and about more, we are all going to work. You know, there is a gradual increase in transmission, and again, here it's not linked to a particular sector. But we all need to revisit. You know, how do we go shopping? How do we go to a restaurant or a bar? Uh, how is our workplace set up? Does it minimize any transmission to um, uh, each other? And I think that's what all of us need to look at all, all over Saskatchewan, and certainly that's the situation in Regina at this time. Thank you. Dr. Kelly, you have a final question? Yeah, one more. So, of course, you know, um, provincial election Monday, a lot of people are going to be going to polling stations. I know that there's physical distancing in place um, and screens and stuff, but I guess you know, what's kind of your message to a whole bunch of people going to one area to vote? What, what's your piece of advice to everyone? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, I, I and my office have been working very closely with Election Saskatchewan. And I must say, you know, Election Saskatchewan, uh, the chief election officer, and Dr. Michael Boda, and the entire staff and volunteers throughout Saskatchewan have been working extremely hard for many months to uh, make uh, this, you know, significant, you know, provincial election uh, as, see, uh, as smooth as possible during a pandemic. Um, and uh, from the information I have, and I think we can ask Election Saskatchewan also to release further details, you know, there's been a large number of uh, polling already through mail-in and other measures. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, advanced ballots are continuing this week. So I think they have advised that, you know, uh, uh, come, uh, don't just leave it to Monday, come earlier, come earlier in the day, don't uh, everyone come after work, for example, and using all these measures to space things out, and from what I've heard, things are working very smoothly. They have set up excellent processes, but we all need to then abide by them. We all need to, you know, um, not go and vote if we are unwell, and uh, if people were unwell and, and were able to, they have uh, uh, arranged for alternate uh, processes for polling, but we shouldn't go to poll if you're unwell, absolutely. Uh, when we go, wear a mask, maintain your physical distance, follow all the guidelines, I think that is going to be really important to keep all of us safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Shahab. Thank you very much, Scott Livingstone. That concludes our COVID update for today. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good weekend.